All right, so I'm continuing to do sermons that are on core doctrines. Tonight I'm going to be doing a sermon that's dealing with the peculiar people, as I mentioned before, continuing on along those lines. But this morning, or this afternoon, we're going to be, I'm going to be preaching or teaching on the subject of salvation again. Now, I, I taught on once saved, always saved a few weeks back. And, of course, that's a very critical doctrine. But another doctrine that goes hand in hand with that is this, the concept of repentance and what how repentance relates to salvation and there's a lot of confusion about this so there's a lot of heresy and false teaching out there regarding this subject now you may be thinking pastor Burzins, i know this inside and out i know the repentance issue and amen and amen and i just want to mention this right off the bat because especially as we're going through some of the fundamental doctrines if you're if you're more spiritually grown you've been around for a while you know, you, you can't expect to just hear something brand new like every time you come to church. And actually, if you did, I'd be a little bit worried about what that church is teaching. Because you don't want to go somewhere where everything's just brand new. Wow, I've never heard that before. I've never heard that before. Right? Because that's how you're going to find yourself in false doctrine and false teaching. These are very old, ancient truths. They're established. They're tried. They're true. These are real fundamental and basic. But... One thing, hopefully, I could, you could get, get away from this is just some extra verses, maybe something you haven't really thought of before, or at the very least, you can use your, um, your notes on the back and just mark down a couple of the references that I'm going to go to, because we've got lots of places in the Bible to prove this. And this is actually a very big hang-up for a lot of people when you're out preaching the gospel. I just experienced this yesterday. Now, thankfully, the guy I preached to, he ended up getting saved. But one of the things that, that he brought up was this repentance issue. And he kind of gave the right answer at first, but then he was like, you know, when, when I gave him an example of well, what, do you, what happens if somebody puts their faith in Christ... But then later on, they sin, they do something real bad, and they die. And he's like, well, you know, they, they, need to, they would have needed to repent of that. And they need to repent of that sin, or else they're not going to make it to heaven. And this is a common belief that a lot of people have. And I'll tell you right now, if someone believes that you have to repent of any sins, of, of you know, specific sins or really bad sins, that person is not saved. And I'm going to prove it to you this afternoon that that is a works-based salvation. And we're going to use the Bible as our source. The Bible is our definition for these words. And we want to be very careful that we're always using very clear terminology when we preach the gospel and very accurate terminology for that matter as well. You know, a lot of people use phrases like, oh, I, I invited Jesus into my heart. Now... That can be, mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. It's not very clear. Now, I, if someone uses that terminology, especially when I'm out sowing, I mean, it's not, it's not like it's just awful. But we just want to be very, very careful that we are going to be very clear when we try to present the gospel to other people. And you always need to make sure when someone makes a statement like that, that you dig deeper and try to figure out what is it exactly that they mean by that. And even as we go through this, if someone tells you you have to repent of your sins to be saved, dig deeper. Because there's actually a lot of people who are saved that will say that statement. They'll make that statement because they've heard it over and over and over and over and over and over again. But when you really ask them what their beliefs are, they don't believe that you have to like give up your sins in order to be saved. They don't think you have to do that. They are actually trusting in Jesus Christ. But when you hear something just repeated, 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 just get drilled into your head, you end up repeating a lot of the things that you hear. So uh, we're going to dig into this. We're starting off here in Genesis chapter 6. It's actually the very first mention of repent or repented or repenting, you know, any form of the word repent in the Bible is found here in Genesis chapter 6. And it's very interesting because the very first mention, it's talking about God repenting. I think the most common misconception that people have about the word repent is that they automatically assume, if you just ask someone to define repent, just your average person out there, average churchgoer, 
what they're going to probably tell you is to turn from your sins. They define repent for me. Turn from your sins. And they automatically associate the word repent with turning from sin. And that's false. The word repent most basically and literally means to re- Think. And I brought this up in a previous sermon. You know, if you know any other foreign languages, there's a root word has come from that pent. And like in Spanish, it's pensar. And, and I don't I, I know there's other languages, Germanic languages, that'll have a similar type of a root to it. Uh, I, I, I'm not fluent in any, in any, la any other languages, but I've seen them before. I've seen the, the references, and they all mean to think. Like in Spanish, I know pensar means to think. And here, even in English, if someone's a pensive person, it means they're thoughtful. If so, you know, so the root word of this just is from to think. And when you repent, you're rethinking. You're thinking again. You're, you're, you're changing your mind about something. Now, depending on how you use it in the context, repentance is necessary for salvation. We're going to get into that in a little bit, but I want to start just kind of showing you that in order to understand what this word means, we always have to get it in context and try to stress that when you, if you have to explain this to somebody who believes you have to return from their sins or repent of their sins, that because it's been drilled into their heads so much that repent means turn from sins, you have to show them, no, repent by itself doesn't have anything to do with sin. In some contexts, it does have to do with sin, but in many contexts, it has nothing to do with sin. And in Genesis chapter 6, is one of those instances, it has nothing to do with sin. Look at verse number 6, the Bible says, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. So in Genesis 6, we start to see... You know, people becoming wicked. He created Adam and Eve, and they have their generations, and generations are passing now in between Adam and Eve and Noah. And during this time span, people are getting really wicked in their heart. They're, they're, only, they're only doing wicked kind of like continually. They're having just evil thoughts, and, they're, and they've turned really wicked in a relatively short period of time. Just, you know, hundreds of years are going by, and, he's, and God's just kind of upset now. He's grieved. He's upset. He's sad. And he's thinking like, I, I shouldn't have even made man. I shouldn't have even created man, because this is what's happening. That's the way the word is being used. It repented the Lord. He's kind of changing his mind now like, I, I almost wish I didn't make man because this is what's happening. This is what they're turning out to do. Verse number seven says, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls, fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And I think this is very interesting that the very first mention of uh, usage of repent, it's, first of all, it's God that's repenting. It's God that, that's changing his mind. But the other thing is that it's, it's also associated here with grace. And it's not associated with it, but it's contrasted with grace. It's not that repentance and grace are being tied together. It's that Noah is someone who's receiving grace. He's receiving grace by definition means it's something that you don't deserve, but you're given anyways. It's something that's extended to you. It's given to you undeservedly, unmeritedly. It's just offered for free, usually out of love or out of concern or you know, just to do something nice. Just like when you know, many of you have bills to pay, probably all of you have bills to pay, and usually with whatever bill it is you have to pay, whether it be a mortgage or rent or, you know, a utility bill, they give you a due date of like, you know, the first of the month. But then they extend a grace period unto you that says, well, you know, we're not going to charge you any extra fees. We're not going to penalize you in any way during this grace period. So really you have until like the 14th or the 15th of the month or something like that, or however long they want to extend to you. That's just grace. It's due on the first. You're supposed to have it in there on the first. But, you know, we're going to allow you a little bit of extra time and just show you some grace. That's what, a, what grace is. And, and what God's doing here, he's extending grace unto Noah and saving him because he wants to destroy all of mankind but to Noah, he's going to extend grace upon him. Now turn, if you would, over to Exodus chapter 13. Oh, 
We're going to look at a few different usages of the word repent to help us to try to, to get a good, solid definition. You say, Pastor Burson, I don't know if you're right about that, that pensar thing and repent and rethink. Well, let's just look at these various usages in the Bible when it uses the word repent and see if it matches up with that definition. See if it actually holds water, if it makes sense. We already saw from this very first mention that turning from sin doesn't make sense as a definition because God is the one repenting. And we know that God doesn't sin. The Bible says that the Lord is holy. Exodus 13, verse number 17. The Bible says, And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, Lest peradventure the people repent when they see war, and they return to Egypt. What's interesting about this is that in this situation, repentance actually would have been a bad thing. It's not a positive thing. It's not a good thing. It's not something he wanted them to do. And in the context, we see what's happening in Exodus. Okay, the book of Exodus, it is the mass exodus of the children of Israel from Egypt. That's why it's called Exodus, because it's all about Moses leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. In the book of Exodus, this is after now all the plagues, you know, they, they've been delivered from Egypt and they're headed to the promised land. And the Bible's stating here, you know what, there was a path that was a much more direct route to get into the land of Canaan. But they would have had to go through the land of the Philistines. And he's, he basically what he's saying is here is that it was a lot closer, it would have been more convenient to go through the land of the Philistines. But since the children of Israel were so weak, they've been under the bondage, they've had all the stuff going on. He's saying, I didn't want them to just be confronted with war right away after they've just gotten out of the slavery. You know, they've had all these, these struggles, these difficulties, and now they've got to face a battle. It's going to be overwhelming for them. And I don't want them just to say, well, instead of fighting this war and getting involved in this fight, we're just going to go back into Egypt because at least we don't have to fight these big battles. We'll just go back into being slaves. And that's what it means. That's exactly what he's talking about when he says the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. So right now they have a mind of following the Lord and wanting to go on to the promised land. But if they were confronted with a war, God's saying, you know what, they might change their mind. They might repent and say, no, we're going to go back this way. We're headed this way, now we're going to go back over there. That would have been a bad thing. Turn, if you go to Jeremiah chapter 4. And, and again, in that Exodus 13, if the people were repenting, if they would have repented, they were not repenting from sin. They actually would have been repenting to sin because they'd be going back into Egypt. In Jeremiah chapter 4, this is, there's another reference here that also has nothing to do with sin. Now, there's a lot of references to the word repent, so don't worry, we're not going to go through all of them. There's over 100 references. And it's an inter a very interesting word study. And, and you know, I, I encourage you to do this if you, uh, you want to learn more about particular subjects. Word studies are great. Now, you always got to be careful with it. I don't, I don't recommend it if you've never even read through the Bible cover to cover one time. Read the Bible first. You know, get through, make sure you understand, you understand context of what you're reading, and then start getting into the more deep studies. But if you've already been through your Bible, it's kind of familiar to you, you know, you know what each book is generally about, you know what the stories are, you, could, you want to learn something about, you know, get, dig a little deeper, start doing, you could do start doing some of these studies and, and see for yourself all the various mentions and, and start to learn um, just more about them. Jeremiah 4.27, the Bible says, For thus hath the Lord said. So th these are the words of God. Thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black, because I have spoken it. Who has spoken it? The Lord. I have purposed it. Who has purposed it? The Lord. And will not repent, neither will I turn back from it. 
So here's another example of God speaking, and he's saying, I will not repent. Is he talking about turning from his sins? No. Again, God doesn't have sins. But he says, I have purposed it and will not repent. So he said, I've spoken it. This is my intention. This is my purpose. This is my mind. I'm headed this way, and I'm not going to change my mind. I'm not going to repent. I'm not going to turn back from this direction. From this thought, from this plan, that is his purpose. So turn, if you would, now to Matthew chapter 3. We're going to get into the New Testament. I just wanted to point out a few, and there's lots of examples very similar to these few that I pointed out. There's a lot more that basically will teach the same exact thing. But I, I didn't want to get, uh, you know, just beat a dead horse, as it were, with, with these examples because you can, you can get the concept very quickly. But the reason why I'm making an effort to teach on this subject is because there's a lot of people out there that teach you must repent in order to be saved. And then they'll tell you that repent means you're turning from your sin. And we've already demonstrated that now, definitely from the Old Testament, that just the word repent by itself doesn't mean you're turning from your sin. And I'm showing you that you have to watch out for this heretical false teaching and study the scripture to see if that's actually correct. It doesn't matter how many times someone repeats a phrase. You have to repent of your sins, repent of your sins, repent of your sins. It doesn't matter how many times they say it. What does the Bible say? That's what's the most important. What does Scripture actually say? And the reason why people get away with this for so long is because the vast majority of people don't want to read their Bible. It's actually work to check on if what you're hearing is true or not. It requires effort on your part. But you know what doesn't require effort? I mean, it requires very minimal effort just showing up to church and just let someone else just tell you everything about what the Bible says. And then you can just go home and just believe, well, that person, you know, whatever they said, I'm going to believe it. They're the expert. Just they said it, so it must be true. And you know, this goes for not just... Christianity, not just the Bible. I don't trust anybody inherently. You're going to get yourself into trouble when you start just, just trusting any so-called expert about anything. Now, it doesn't mean that every expert's a liar. But there are liars out there. There are people who are misled. There are genuinely, you know, uh, sincere people that are misled. I know what my own thoughts are on, on medical care and things like that. There are people out there that I believe are very sincere in what they prescribe as, as you know, good health, in medications and other things. They're very sincere. They wholeheartedly believe what they're trying to do for you. But I believe that in many cases, they're actually harming you and not doing you good. This is one example why I don't always just trust an expert, a so-called expert, because they may be misled. You can have someone that might be a, a relative or a family friend that's a, a pastor or a preacher of a church, and you might know them and be like, this person's sincere. It may be your own parent. And they say, they would never want to lead me astray. And you know what? You, I might believe that. They might not want to lead you astray. There may be some very sincere Muslims in this world that actually love their children and they think they're doing good by teaching them Islam. I'm sure there's people out there like that. There's many Catholics out there that, that have this sincere belief. They think it's right. They think it's true, but they're wrong. They're deceived. It's not the truth. So you can't just go and trust what anybody says just because they're your mom or just because they're your dad or just because they're an expert or just because they're a priest or just because, you know, whatever it is. We need to do our best and do our diligence to search things out for ourselves. Now, obviously, there's only so many hours in a day and there's only so much you can really check on every single thing that you hear. That's why you need to prioritize what are the most important things. And I would say, you know, health is pretty important. But your soul and your spirit and what's going to happen, that's the most important. 
You're, you're teaching on what, what's right and wrong, morality, heaven, hell. These are the most important things in this life because it's going to affect you for eternity. So we need dead sure need to make sure that we're, that we're getting this right, that we're right on this. Not only are there some people who are confused that are sincere, but there's also a lot of people who are wicked people. And they don't care about you. They don't care about other people. They care about themselves only. There's a lot of wolves out there that wear sheep's clothing. They try to look real good on the outside, but on the inside, they're full of wickedness and evil and destruction, and all they care about is themselves, and they don't care who they hurt in the process, but they're going to put up the front as long as they can to make more money, to deceive people. They, they don't care. They're wicked people, and they exist. And they go out and they spread these damnable heresies because they don't care. They have no integrity. They don't care about God. They actually, many of them, hate God. And they're going to lie to you for their own agenda. Another reason why you can't just accept everything that you hear. Check it out. Do a little bit of work. How important is it to you? To just know what's right and wrong when it comes to these, especially very important things like God and, and, and morality, what's right and what's wrong. Check it out for yourself. Now, many people will hear sermons preached. They'll go to church and they'll say, oh, well, there's this guy, he preached you have to repent of your sins and be saved, and he used the Bible to do it. And again, that'll be good enough for them. Now, normally, I've heard sermons like this. Usually, you'll hear one verse or two verses and just a lot of talking. We're going to look at a lot of verses today, and I'm going to bring up some of the verses that these people will use. But we're going to look at it in context, and especially the context of the whole Bible. Just about anything in the world can be taught out of the Bible when you just yank a verse here or yank a verse there and don't touch any of the surrounding context at all. You could, you could practically make it say whatever you want it to say. There's enough written to be able to do that. But not when you look at it in context. It's a lot, you can't do it. We need to watch out for the fast talkers and let's get everything in context. It should be clear that just because the word repent is used, it does not automatically have to do with sin. We've already established that. Now look at Matthew chapter 3. We're going to look at some of these verses that the false prophets will use in order to say, see, look, the Bible says you've got to repent of your sins in order to be saved. You've got to turn from all your sins in order to be saved. You say, well, where does the Bible say you have to do that? And they'll say, well, look at Matthew chapter number 3. John the Baptist taught this. Jesus taught this. They all taught you have to repent of your sins and be saved. They're a hard preacher, so you have to repent of your sins. And they'll get people worked up. and you know, Repent of your sins. And repeat it over and over again. And then they'll turn to Matthew 3 and say, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. See, John the Baptist taught you got to repent. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. you got to Turn from all your sins. And they'll add that in there over and over again. So you've got to repent. You've got to turn from your sins. And they'll define it for you that way because they're deceiving you. It, does that say anywhere there you have to turn from all your sins and be saved? Nope. When you look at what the Scripture actually literally says, what did he say? Repent ye, which means all of you. You do need to repent. Why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What you don't see is what the repentance is in this context. So all by itself, we're not given all of the information to understand the full context until you start reading and seeing what was John the Baptist's ministry about? What was Jesus saying? What were they actually teaching? You take one sentence that says, repent ye, you know, it's easy to just throw in any context you want and just say, oh, he's talking about your sins. But it doesn't say that. Turn over to Matthew chapter 4. Same page, next page over, Matthew chapter 4. We're going to look at verse number 17. 
Because they'll turn to this verse too. It's AC. John the Baptist taught repentance and Jesus teaches repentance. Look at verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's basically the same thing that John the Baptist said. They're saying the same thing. And they are saying to repent. Now, people who want to attack churches like ours and what we believe will say, Oh, that church, they don't believe in repentance. I'll tell you right now, I do believe in repentance. I absolutely believe in repentance, but I believe in not being deceitful about what repentance even means and looking at the context about who we're talking about and what, it, and what it's referring to. One, I believe in repenting of sins. I do. I believe everybody should repent of their sins. I believe everybody should live a righteous life. I believe everyone should follow all the commandments of the Lord perfectly without fail. I believe everyone should do that. But you know what I don't believe? I don't believe that any of that is required in order to be saved and go to heaven. Everybody should be perfect. That's why God gave commandments. He didn't give suggestions. He gave commandments because he expects us to do them. And he wants us to do them. And I want to do them. And then hopefully you want to do them too. I do believe when I do something wrong that I should, I should not want to do that anymore and I should turn from that and try to do what's right. I believe in that. But I don't believe that that's what's required in order to be saved, in order to receive eternal life, in order to receive everlasting life. And as we get into this, we'll see exactly why. And, you know, what, what I believe is that, is exactly what the Bible says, that in order to be saved, you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved. We use a very clear verses that literally will just tell you exactly what's required, as opposed to verses that just say, repent ye. It doesn't, even, it doesn't even say, repent ye in order to go to heaven, or repent ye in order to have eternal life. It doesn't even say that. But even if it said that, I wouldn't say that that's false. But it doesn't even say that. It just says, repent ye, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. kingdom of God is at hand. That's it. But they automatically are just going to tell you that means salvation. They're automatically going to tell you that that means giving up a sinful life. When it doesn't mention that at all in context. So if you go to Matthew chapter 9. This is not, now it's going to get way more strong in, in, uh, from their perspective. Matthew chapter 9, we're going to start reading verse number 10. And I have no problems turning to any scripture ever about what anyone teaches. Because I believe the whole Bible is true. And I don't believe there's any contradictions. So I'm not afraid to go to certain verses. You know, like if someone wants to try to teach you salvation by works and they want to turn to James chapter 2, it'd be like, oh no, I can't turn to James chapter 2 because that actually teaches works. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. I'm not afraid to teach, turn to any passage. And I actually prefer to show the passages that people will try to use to teach you false doctrine so that you could just hear it and, and see for yourself and just see, oh yeah. Now if someone tries to come at me with this, I actually have heard this before. I understand the context. I could see this and be like, no, you're not going to deceive me with, with this teaching on repentance because that's not actually what the Bible is teaching right there. Matthew chapter 9, look at verse number 10. The Bible says, And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. So Jesus is having a meal with his disciples. Other people show up, right, publicans, sinners, common people. Verse number 11, And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, he taught repentance. Yeah, he did. He did teach repentance. And he is teaching repentance here. But again, does that say that he's telling these sinners that they have to turn from all of their sins in order to go to heaven? Because I don't see that in the scripture. 
He did preach repentance. And he does. You know what? Jesus believed that they should turn from their sins. He told the woman that was taken in adultery. Remember when, when they were trying to trip, trip Jesus up with his doctrines and his beliefs and, and they're trying to get him to say something false and try to get him with something they could accuse him by. They brought this woman who was you know, taken in adultery in the very act and they're saying, you know, hey, Moses said that she should be put to death, but what do you say? And they're trying to get him to, you know, I'm not going to get into all that, they're trying to get him to say that she should be stoned because the Roman government wouldn't let him execute people and put them to death. And they're trying to then get him arrested by commanding that she should be put to death because it would have, it would have been outside of their, their realm of authority. Then they could have stopped Jesus by getting him arrested. Or they wanted to get him to say, don't stone her. And then say, well, now he's going against Scripture. That was their catch-22. They're trying to get him caught up and put him in a situation that he has no way out of. But how did he answer them? He said, hey, well, he didn't say don't stone her. He says, you that was out sin among you cast the first stone. Now, obviously, there's a lot of my getting all the teaching about that and, and, and everything you can learn from that. But he didn't say not to stone her. He actually said in a way to do it, but in a way not to do it. He says, okay, go ahead. Any, anyone of you without sin, go ahead and, and cast the first stone. Go ahead and do it. It was a very wise thing for him to answer because he's not breaking God's laws. And that's not why he came anyways into this world. He didn't come to be the judge when Jesus Christ was on his earth. He came to save, to seek and to save that which was lost. That was his purpose. That was his mission. He didn't come to set up his kingdom. He didn't come to establish all of God's laws and be the executor of those laws. That's not why he came. That wasn't his purpose. And he wasn't going to let anyone else derail him from what he was here to do. Now he is coming back, and he is going to set up his kingdom, and his laws will be carried out, and they will be executed as he commands them to be. But that's not why he came the first time. He came to be the savior of the world. He didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Again, that's what the scripture says. But what did he say to that woman when everyone left? He said, you know, he says, has no man condemned thee? She said, no man. He says, go and sin no more. Jesus taught for her not to sin anymore. But just because he said that, does that mean that, well, Jesus said not to sin anymore. So that's what you have to do in order to be saved and go to heaven? He didn't say that. He didn't say you have to sin no more in order to go to heaven. He just said, don't sin anymore. Which is good, which is right, which is true. Context is everything. If you're going to understand God's word, we have to understand the context. So when he's sitting with people here in Matthew chapter 9, and they're sinners, they need repentance. They ought to stop sinning. They ought to live righteously. They need repentance. And if you're talking about repentance of their sin, that, that may not even be what he's referring to. And I don't even think it is. But even if, you want, even if you're using it in that capacity of saying, well, they need, they need repentance because they're sinners in, in regards to turning from their sin, he still doesn't say they have to turn from all their sins in order to go to heaven, in order to have eternal life. It's not there. Another verse they'll use is in Mark. Uh, Mark chapter 6. Turn, if you would, to Luke 13. I want to explain Luke 13 real briefly because these are all passages that the, the works-based salvation crowd is going to try to teach you. Mark 6, 12 says, And they went out and preached that men should repent. Again, no context of what the repentance is from or anything like that. It just says men should repent. Okay, amen. Luke 13, Jesus gives an example here of, of some things that were, were happening at the time, some, some recent events that had happened, and explaining a truth on that. So look at verse number 1 of Luke 13. The Bible says, There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So, Pilate had done something apparently very wicked. He's, he's mixing the blood of these, these people from Galilee. They're Galileans, right? 
That's also where Jesus' disciples were from. They're from Galilee. They were Galileans. Right? You remember in, in Acts chapter 2, when they're speaking with these other languages, these other tongues, and they're saying, well, wait a minute, how can these people speak, you know, Arabian? How can any of these people speak any of these other languages? They're, aren't they all Galileans? So they're bringing up, he says, look, there were some Galileans that Pilate mixed their own blood with their sacrifice. Like they were making these sacrifices, and apparently Pilate killed them and mingled their blood with these sacrifices and just totally, uh, um, you know, did abominable things. And verse number two, it says, And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? So he's making a point unto him. He's saying, so are you telling me this because you think that those people, well, they were just really wicked sinners. That's why they had these bad things happen to them. Because that's basically what they're saying. That's what they were thinking. They're, they're bringing up these examples. And he's saying, you know, they had this thought that only, you know, only bad things are going to happen to really wicked people. And if you're doing what's right and good, then nothing bad will ever happen. It's the same mindset that Job's friends had with Job. Because Job was going through all these bad things and these bad events and these you know, curses are happening in his life, his friends are saying, well, you must be in some kind of wicked sin to be going through all this stuff. You could apply the same answer from Jesus. Do you think that Job was, was more wicked than, than any of the other people because that happened to him? And then he answers them in verse number three. He says, I tell you nay. So he says, I tell you no. They weren't any more wicked than anybody else when those events happened to them. And then he says, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Verse number four, he continues, or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. And what's funny about this passage is that the people who believe you have to turn from all of your sins and be saved will, will, will look at Luke 13. See, he's telling them, if you don't repent, then you're going to perish. You're going to die and go to hell. Did he say that these people died and went to hell? No, he used the word perish. Again, the word perish in the context, sometimes it's talking about people going to hell. But the word perish literally by itself just is to die or to expire, right? I mean, we have, we have non-perishable foods, right? Those are foods that basically can be preserved without dying, without expiring, without, without going bad, as opposed to perishable foods. The word perish just literally means that, to die, to expire, to end, to be no good any longer. Um, and what he says in this verse... <coughs> He says, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. What does likewise mean? In the same manner. In the same manner. So he's saying, unless you repent, that is going to happen to you. Because they were thinking they were better than these other people. were saying, no, you're just as wicked as they were, so unless you repent, this is going to happen to you too. Again, no mention of eternal life, no mention of eternal damnation, no mention of what it takes to be saved as far as your soul being saved. Now, turn if you would to Mark chapter 1. I brought up some of these verses in the beginning about John the Baptist preaching, repent ye, and Jesus preaching, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We're going to see in Mark chapter 1 something very similar, but then we're going to also see an explanation, a more detailed account of what exactly he was meaning and what exactly he was saying when he was preaching for them to repent. Mark 1, verse number 4, the Bible says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So now you can look at that. You have a little bit more evidence to say, see, he was preaching repentance for your sins to be remitted, for your sins to go away, for, that, for, for salvation. There's more evidence there solid saying, you see, what he was preaching with repentance has to do with being saved. 
But when we jump down a little bit further in the context now of this passage, look at verse number 14. The Bible says, Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. The repentance that was required is you need to believe the gospel. Now, flip over if you were to Acts chapter 19, because I want to cover this real quick before I get into explaining the rest of uh, Mark 1.15 there. Because Paul explains very clearly what the baptism of repentance literally is that John the Baptist was preaching. When he said, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, this is what he was saying, Acts 19, and you might want to make note of this or highlight this. Um, if anyone wants to try to tell you, because they'll tell you, well, Jesus and John the Baptist preach repentance. Acts 19, verse 4, Paul tells you exactly what he was preaching. Acts 19, 4, the Bible says, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. Is that what John was doing? We saw in Mark 1, 4, and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So what John the Baptist was preaching in his baptism of repentance for the remission of sins is what Paul is about to say here in Acts 19, 4. John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, this is what he said, they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So when John preached the baptism of repentance, he said, you need to believe on Jesus Christ. That's what it meant. That's, that's what his baptism of repentance meant. In order to be saved, in order for your sins to be remitted, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, doesn't that match up perfectly with what everything else in the Bible already says? Doesn't that match up with what Jesus said when he says, repent ye and believe the gospel? You say, well, then what, why does it say repent? I don't understand. It's because you're still thinking that repent has to do with sins. Remember at the beginning of the sermon, I, I, I explained the word repent just means you're changing your mind about something. The reason why people need to repent in order to believe the, the gospel, in order to believe on Jesus Christ, is because they weren't already believing on Jesus to be saved. They were believing in something else. If you believe today that you have to be a good person to go to heaven, in order for you to be saved and go to heaven, you need to repent. You need to rethink. You need to change your mind and say, you know what? No. That's not going to get me to heaven because I'm a sinner. No amount of good works that I do is going to get me to heaven. You need to change your mind and understand and admit, I need a Savior. My works won't cut it. I'm going to change my mind and I'm going to put all my faith now in Jesus Christ because He paid for my sins. Now I'm believing something different than I was before. I've changed my mind. I've repented. Now I believe in Jesus Christ. Now you're saved. Whether it be Islam, Catholicism, whatever, idolatry, false religion, the religion of the Pharisees, Judaism, in order to be saved, you have to repent of that belief and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Fill in the blank of whatever it is anybody's trusting to be saved and believe on Jesus Christ. That's what repentance is in regards to being saved. So depending on the context, sometimes repentance, or the word repent, has nothing to do with salvation. But when we see it used specifically in the context of being saved, as in John the Baptist preached the gospel of or the repentance, the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, Remission of sins. Okay, yeah, we're talking about salvation. We're talking about your sins being remitted. They're being paid for. Well, that specifically is you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is spelled and defined very clearly from Scripture. Acts 19.4, Paul stated unequivocally, that's what John taught. That's what he said. That's what the baptism of repentance is. Matches up perfectly with Acts 16, 30 and 31, which very explicitly says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do? What do I have to do? I want to be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. 
very clear verses. We're not, we're not talking about some parable. We're not talking about people perishing at the Tower of Siloam and you know all this other stuff. We're talking about someone asks a question, hey, I want to be saved. What do I have to do? And very clear answer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and, and thou shalt be saved. Very clear scripture. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting life is brought up. Obviously, we're talking about salvation. For God sent His Son in the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You notice what we're not hearing in that verse at all? Turning from your sins. Repent of your sins. Live a good life. Do what's right. Make Jesus the Lord of your life. Follow His commandments. None of that. But in context, are those verses talking about salvation? Absolutely they are. Very clearly they are. John 3, 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Not he that believeth and turns from his sins. He that believeth. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 18. We're almost done. Jeremiah chapter 18. This next passage. Because as I mentioned, there's, there's over 100 verse, verses that will use the word repent in the Bible or some form of it. And there are a few I didn't get to today because I did, there's just not enough time to cover everything about this subject. But I'm trying to give you the most clear verses where there's not as much wiggle room, not as much doubt on what is this actually teaching. It's very clear. It's very concise. Because we can use the clear verses to understand the rest of them that maybe aren't quite as clear. There's a couple passages, though, that people will try to turn to to say, no, no, no. See, you need to turn from your wicked ways in order to be saved, in order to go to heaven. And look, this is what the Bible says here. Now, hopefully I've already demonstrated that the Bible teaches very clearly that that's not a requirement. But we also need to understand, I mean, the Bible doesn't contradict itself. Oftentimes, when, it, when I try to persuade someone on, on a particular belief or doctrine or salvation, people will, will, that disagree oftentimes will want to get in a tit-for-tat of like, well, what about this verse? You say, well, what about this verse? And what about this verse? As if they're like saying different things. But they're not. If the Bible contradicts itself, it's not the Word of God. Because God doesn't contradict Himself. God doesn't, you know, in, like is schizophrenic in, in that he's believing one thing and another thing, and you know, like he doesn't. He, that's not God. All of God's words are true. They all line up and match perfectly, and all the teachings work together without any problems whatsoever. So Jeremiah 18 kind of holds the key to certain other pass passages that you might find in Ezekiel and a few other places that'll teach you that you need to turn from your wickedness in order to be saved. Which is repenting of sin. But the salvation that it's referring to is not your soul going to heaven. And you need to understand that. Look at Jeremiah chapter 18, verse number 7, spells this out very clearly. The Bible says, At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. If it do evil in my sight that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. There are times in Scripture where God is addressing an entire nation, entire group of people. And the way that God judges people, as in a group of people, as in a nation, is based on their works. 
When God chooses to destroy a nation or a large group of people physically from the earth, it's because of their sins which is completely separate from a person's individual soul being saved and going to heaven. And he spells it out in Jeremiah 18 there. He says, look, concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom, if that nation gets right, if they turn from their evil, if they turn from doing bad things, God will spare them. But if they do wickedly, he's going to destroy them. We saw in Genesis. What did he do? He destroyed the nation, whatever, the people that existed because they were doing wicked things. Noah got grace. But he, he destroyed this mass group of people. And you know what, how he destroyed them? Physically. It doesn't mean that every single soul went to hell when people died in the flood. But the whole group of people overall died. They were destroyed. Turn, if you would, the last place I'll be turning is Jonah chapter 3. Because in Jonah, the book of Jonah is real short, four chapters. And most people remember Jonah because you think of Jonah and the whale, right? A lot of children hear this growing up. I know I teach my kids. They love the story. They hear about Jonah. He's, you know, God commands him to go out and preach, and he's, he's being disobedient. He doesn't want to do what God tells him to do, so he gets in a boat, tries to run away, tries to run away from God. And uh, he's on this boat, and there's this big storm comes, right? And they throw Jonah overboard, and then God had prepared this great whale to come, and the whale swallows him up. So he spends three days and three nights in the heart of a whale, in the, in the belly of the whale. So he's swallowed up, right? Then he gets spit back out uh, up on land. And kids love this story because it's a pretty cool story anyways. I think it's a cool story. It's pretty exciting, right? The guy gets swallowed up. Can't imagine what that must have been like inside of a whale's belly, but it's definitely not what the cartoons depict it to be. It's not some fun thing where you just like light a torch and you're just kind of floating on a raft. I guarantee it wasn't like that for Jonah. But um, you might remember this story, but his whole job, his whole mission was to go into Nineveh. And Nineveh was a really wicked city at this time. And his job was to preach against the city as a whole. And to preach a message of warning that God was going to destroy that nation, that city. So remember, we just saw in Jeremiah 18, concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom... If you do wickedly, he's going to destroy you. And if you do right, if you get right, if you repent, if they turn from their wickedness, he'll spare that nation. It, this is exactly what happens in Jonah. Look at verse number 4 of Jonah chapter 3. Jonah 3, verse number 4. The Bible says, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's his message. God's going to overthrow this city. He's going to destroy you. In 40 days, you've got 40 days, and God's going to wipe out Nineveh. But look at what happens in verse number 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God. So right off the bat, it starts off, they believe Him. They hear the Word of God, and they believe it. And proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh. And he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and then sat in ashes. And if you're not familiar with the Bible and Scripture and what they're talking about, sackcloth and ashes is, is an outward sign of you being very sorry and repentant in your heart towards God that you put on basically like, like really just, just not fancy clothing at all, just, just a sackcloth. It's a kind of a cloth. There's a covering and ashes. And, you know, you're, you're just kind of real down and, and humbling yourself and making yourself really low in the sight of God in the hopes that God will show mercy because you're getting your heart right with Him. And you're going to stop doing the things that you're doing that were making God angry as a whole, as a people, all the way up to the king. The people received this message. Verse number 7 says, And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. So he declares a fast. Because they're trying to get right with God. 
Verse number 8. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. They recognize now what they were doing was wicked and it was wrong. And they're going to say, you know what? We're done with that. We're going to get right with God. Verse number 9, and, and this is still their thought process, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Just saying, who knows? Let's try, let's humble ourselves. Let's stop doing this wickedness. Maybe God will change his mind. Maybe God will repent and he won't destroy us as he said he would. Because the message that Jonah was given, hey, you're going to be destroyed. So they get right. They turn from their evil way as a nation. So what happens? God spares Nineveh as a whole. Does that mean every single person in Nineveh got saved because they believed on the Lord? No. That, that's not reasonable to think that every single individual in, that, in all of Nineveh all got saved all on that day or in those short days. No way. But as a whole, the nation decided to stop doing their wickedness. Does that mean they're all perfect and they never sin anymore? No, of course not. But they, they stopped being really grievous in their sins to God, and God decided to spare them. And verse number 10 spells it all out. And if you don't have this verse memorized, I suggest memorizing this because this is key to, um, to explaining this, this um, concept to people who are, who are backwards on it. The Bible says, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that He had said that He would do unto them, and He did it not. So God repents. He changes His mind. He doesn't destroy the city. Why? Because He saw their works. And what's so important about this verse is it defines turning from your evil way as works. God calls that works. You turn from your sin, you turn from your evil way, you, you stop sinning and you turn over a new leaf and you start doing good. Congratulations, God wants you to do that, but you know what you're doing? You're doing good works. And if that's what you're trusting in to be saved and go to heaven, you're going to go to hell when you die. Because the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for by grace, remember Noah was saved by grace? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If turning from your evil way is a work according to God, you cannot trust in that to be saved and go to heaven. It's not about you. When you believe that your efforts and your works and your doing right has anything to do with you going to heaven, what you're doing is you're stealing the glory from Jesus Christ. Or you're suggesting that what he did when he died on that cross and rose again from the dead was not enough to pay for your sins. It was not enough to save your soul and that you need to add your own works to it and you're bringing down the name of Jesus Christ instead of just accepting that free gift. And oftentimes people unwittingly, unknowingly are, are buying into this repent of your sins for salvation because they haven't thought it all the way through. Because it hasn't been explained to them. They haven't seen everything in context. They've only heard a couple of very vague verses being preached and a preacher just spout off, repent of your sins, repent of your sins. You got to repent of your sins and be saved. It's not what the Bible teaches. If you're a nation, that's what the Bible teaches. America as a whole, if America turns and repents of its wickedness, God will spare the United States of America. Any nation for that matter. If the nation as a whole turns to the Lord and says, God, we've sinned, we repent, we are right with you, God could hold off and stay His judgment. If a person tries to do that in order to gain access into heaven, not going to happen. Matthew 7 teaches us, Many shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, 
Have we not prophesied in thy name? Let me get it. I don't have, I don't have the whole thing memorized exactly word perfect. I'll say, it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. There's someone who's trusting in their works, trusting in their reformed life, trusting in their repentance of sin to get into heaven. And then what's God going to say unto them? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I don't know you. I never knew you. And you're not saved. And you're not getting into heaven. Because you think it's your good works that are getting you here. Instead of what Jesus Christ did for you. Very, very critical doctrine and one that's been under attack for a long time and taught falsely for a long time in a lot of churches. And unfortunately, this one very thing is keeping a lot of people out of heaven because they're trusting in their works. I want to make sure everybody here is very crystal clear on this subject and understands what they believe and why they believe it and, and can defend it from the scriptures and can turn to passages to show other people why salvation is truly a free gift and has nothing to do with your own works at all. No matter how you slice it. It's completely free. That is critical to the uh, it's a core faith of this church and it's a core faith that you have to have in order to be saved. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the clear teaching from your word, dear God. I pray that you would please help us to be diligent in our own studies, in our own search, in our own just um, making sure that what we hear, what we, what we believe is all based on your words. And that we should go back and, and check these things out and read everything in context, Lord. And we pray that you would please guide us in all wisdom and in all knowledge. And God, I pray that you would please help us to teach these great truths unto the lost, unto, unto people who don't know these things, Lord. And pray that you please use our church mightily. Lord, help us all to be strengthened and encouraged and edified. And God, I pray that you please help us not to be discouraged by other things that might have happened. I know there's going to be a lot of attacks on this church. The more people that we lead to Christ, the more that there's going to be... Um, potential setbacks and people trying to be uh, just being attacked from trying to do what's right, Lord. And I pray that you please strengthen us all that are, that are here and, and here to love you and want to do your work. It's in Jesus' name we pray.